remember, I think it was last week we did a Radio Free Geneva and I responded to uh, William Lane Craig and the video he put up on Romans chapter nine and pointed out that he, <laughs> he, pu he pulled the flowers on Romans chapter nine. He, he read through about verse six, jumped down to the end of the chapter and moved on from there skipped over, didn't even read, interact with, take notice of, bring into the consideration the key elements of Romans 9, 7 through 24 or so. <laughs> it's, it's just interesting. Uh, that, that seems to be the, the best way people have to get around Romans 9 is let's just not actually read it. Let's, let's just give some overall overarching assertions about what it's about and let's not actually walk through it. Um, been there, done that, got the debate t-shirt in 2015 myself. So I know exactly how that, uh, how that works. And a conversation ensued because Seth Dillon, uh, promoted that video in a, in a tweet. Now, if you're wondering who Seth Dillon is, he's uh, now the CEO of Babylon B. Now he didn't start it as I understand. Um, that was Adam Ford who has moved on to other things. And now uh, Seth Dillon is the CEO of Babylon B. And so someone tagged me because if I recall correctly, something had been said about Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, and the issue of saving faith and faith is a gift of God. And had said, you, if I recall they had said, you might want to look at what I had written on the subject in the Potter's Freedom, or somehow I got tagged. And so I started seeing, you know how, if you, if you don't do Twitter, you start seeing comments coming through your textual flow, shall we say, um, your timeline. And so I, you know, I, I saw this for a little bit and, and then finally saw some tweets that made me go, well, no, no, wait a minute. Uh, that's, Okay, I'll go ahead and, you know, start commenting on a few things. Because it was all the standard stuff. It was Erasmus and Luther. It was stuff we've gone over and over and over. I've written one, two, at least three. You could probably say up to five if you throw in a couple of the other books. Uh, books on these subjects. We've done debates over the years. Um, lots of Radio Free Geneva's and things like that. And so Seth and I start going back and forth and I would go to a certain text and I'd go to John chapter six. And what does he do? He does the John 12 escape route. Those of you who've listened to this program for years knows exactly what I'm talking about. When you go to John 6, 44, what do people do? They jump out of John six into the future for the audience in John six to John chapter 12 interpret a text there out of its context. They never ever mention that this is where Jesus is being sought by the Greeks. And this is from where Jesus is talking in response that never meets with the Greeks. So he's talking about nationalities here because it's the Greeks that are seeking after him. So it's Gentiles and et cetera, et cetera. I'll jump over there. If I be lifted up, I'll draw a man unto myself. And I, Again, provided the answer that I didn't come up with these answers. These have been provided for a very, very long time, back into the earlier part of the church, but especially since the Reformation. And I pointed out that if that is the case, then you're stuck with universalism. First of all, you're, you're misunderstanding John 12. You are really presenting the idea that the cross is an attraction to all people when in fact the biblical teaching is the cross repels first corinthians chapter one preaching the cross is them they're perishing foolishness um and in fact paul himself makes god's election the determining factor as to whether the cross is something that is the power of god to you or foolishness to you it's whether god elected you or not that's that's what first corinthians chapter one says that's its whole message. That's why he says it is by his doing you're in Christ Jesus. So no man may boast. That's what first Corinthians chapter one is all about. That's its essence. But so you end up with this weird view 
from John chapter 12, and then you read it back into John chapter 6, called eisegesis. This is not how you do exegesis. This is not how you handle the text of Scripture. You take something from, that's from the future, read it back into a text that the audience could never have known of at that point in time, and say, voila, there it is. That's how you should understand it. The problem is, once you do that, it turns you into a universalist. Because in John 6, 44, the one who is drawn by the Father is raised up by the Son. And so if all people are drawn universally, that's what you did with John 12. You read it back into John 6, now Jesus is going to raise them all up in the last day. And it's very clear in John chapter 6 that every time it's raised up in the last day, it's being raised to eternal life. It's not just raised and then judged and sent into hell or something like that. No, it's universalism. So I pointed this out. I've gotten no... Every time I've gone to the text and pointed to grammatical issues, um, issues along those lines, I've gotten no response. What I've gotten is the standard, well, it can't be that because of all these other verses. And when we go to the other verses, we find out they're not saying what Seth is saying either. So one of the key issues is, um, well, here, just a little while ago, no text has been modified, he says with a straight face. That's me. As he edits his Bible in dozens of places to make the words world, whosoever, all, and everyone mean only the elect. You have an audacity. I'll give you that. Now, he's told me he's read my books. I don't believe him. I'm sorry. Sorry, Seth. I don't believe you. Because you're a smart guy. And if you had, your responses would be much better than they've been so far. I don't think you've read them. I, I really don't. Um, so, when someone says world to me, I go, so, as John says in 1 John chapter 2, we are not to love the world, right? But God's to love the world, and we're to be like God. So you've got a contradiction, right? Because world always means the same thing every place it's used, right? See, it's, it's so easy to, to tear apart the synergistic, eisegetical gymnastics that man's tradition has forced upon a lot of people. We've been doing this a while. This is, this is not our first rodeo. We've heard all this stuff before. The term world is used by John minimally 10 different ways, possibly 14 different ways in his gospel alone. So are you talking cosmos? Are you talking ion? Are you talking, what, what are you talking about? Are you talking about inhabited world? There's lots of different ways to even translate various Greek words as the word world. So where have I said world means only the elect? Very common. Again, it, you, you, know, you read Dave Hunt. You read, that's what they always say. But let's be specific. What's the text? Whosoever. Wow. Shall we go back to the open letter to Dave Hunt back in 2000? On what pas ha pistuon means? Everyone believing? That started quite an interesting movement uh, back at that point in time. Did, it shouldn't have. It's, again, we're not saying anything that hasn't been said by generations before us. Every generation has to deal with this. Why? Well, what's the human tendency? To diminish man's power and authority or to exalt man's power and authority? You, you tell me. What is more likely that mankind will seek to control God's sovereignty and power and put us in charge? Or the other. It's pretty obvious. That's why in every generation we have to deal with the constant creeping humanism uh, that comes in. And so, uh, you know, when he says, you have an audacity, I'll give you that. Well, <laughs> thank you very much. But what I actually have is the text and you don't. That's the difference between us. You've got your traditions. And when you say, well, but there's all these clear texts, and then I go to them, and I showed you Philippians 1.29, no answer. I gave you lexical meanings. I gave you syntactical categories. I didn't, I don't think, I don't remember quoting Greek to you yet, but if you want to go there, we can do that. That's fine. But I was giving you the data that underlies the English translations. And if it's audacious to, to go to those things, great, fine, wonderful. 